Welcome to Slaughterhouse Stories. I hope you enjoy the stories I have for you tonight. Hello, to all you things you go bump in the night. Hello to all you humans as well. Welcome to the show that brings you creepypastas, short scary stories, and dark horror-themed poetry from all across the world. This is the Slaughterhouse Stories Podcast, Episode 48, My Son Heard Santa on the Roof. I'm your host and narrator, Ghost Train, telling you to lock your doors, get under your blanket, and keep the lights on. And keep the lights on. You can find the links to my socials in the show notes. Come, discuss all things spooky with me. Also, if you'd like to write in in every email around the show, email slaughterhousestoriespodcast at gmail.com with creepypasta requests, stories you've written, or your own real-life paranormal encounters. Before we get to tonight's first story, I'd like to ask you a favor. If you're enjoying the show, please head over and leave a review through iTunes and help spread the word to your friends, family, the Christmas demon trying to steal your child, whomever. Tell them, be a listener, not a victim. Now, let's get spooky. To start us off tonight is a story by Dream State about a teenager who thought he'd have his normal night of horror movies and gaming, but instead makes a shocking and terrifying discovery about mirrors and our reflections. What does he find out? What is this truth about our reflections? Cover up your mirrors, sit back, relax, and enjoy what happens when we aren't looking. Haven't you ever noticed when you look into a mirror, it's hard not to make eye contact with your reflection. It makes you feel uneasy, right? I know I do. While the other day it was late at night, I had to use the restroom, so I went upstairs and turned on the light. Something felt off, but I shrugged it away and did my duty. As I was leaving the restroom and glanced at my mirror, that's when I saw it. My reflection was dark, nothing but a blur really. Within the fraction of a second it took for me to blink, my reflection was back to normal, looking me in the eyes and smiling when I did. I ignored it, figuring it was just part of my overactive imagination. I went downstairs and continued on with my evening activities. A few horror movies, an hour or so of gaming on my computer. The usual boring night for a teenage guy with no plans. A few games deep into my playtime, I had a queasy feeling about myself. Not like a sick feeling, but a nervous, anxious feeling. I glanced up to look at my room's mirror and thought I saw something in the window. I got up right away and turned on a light to see what the hell it was. I was freaking out because this was the second time in the night I had seen something. Well, when I looked out the window, nothing was there. This was a relief, because I sleep on the second floor of my house. I turned around and happened to look at the mirror again. I saw it for sure this time. My reflection, a dark figure staring me down. I didn't blink this time. I knew for a fact that it was there. I stood up straight and walked towards it. The lights in my room were on, so I felt a little safer than before. However, the closer I got to my reflection, the clearer it got. I could make out facial features, short shaggy hair, a crooked smile, and the worst part of it were its eyes, bleeding and hollow. It looked to be stuck in a scream of pain. I almost felt pity for it, but it was beyond harrowing. It was evil, at the deepest part of reality. All of it was pitch black. All the light that was cast upon my reflection was soaked up, never to be seen again. This time, the reflection wouldn't disappear, no matter how badly I wanted it to. It waved to me. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. It was like its gaze held me in place. I was so horrified to what I was seeing. I could only hope it was a dream. That's when it spoke. I still don't know if it was because I was in shock, 
or because it had no voice, but I could hear nothing coming from the mirror. It started raising its arm, looking like it was reaching out to me. I looked down and saw my arm was in the air too. It was controlling me. As it took a step closer to the mirror, so did I. Thank the Lord for my parents having other children, because my older brother had come into my room, asking why I didn't accept his game invite. The moment he came into the room, I dropped to the floor, finally able to control myself again. With him in the room, I explained to him what had happened to me, and we decided to look at the mirror together. Our reflections were there, but normal this time. He thought it was crazy, as would anyone who didn't see it for themselves. To be cautious, I grabbed my laptop to join him downstairs and sit with him, while we continued to game. After a round or so, I had completely forgotten about my dark reflection. I slept relatively well for the night, except I had one nagging feeling that something was watching me. When I woke, I knew what it was. It was me. Well, not me, but my reflection. Every time I pass by a mirror or some sort of reflection, it is there, watching me, trying to get me inside with it, trying to pull me in. Ever since that night, I haven't been able to look into a mirror without another person in the room. I don't think our reflections dare show themselves to someone else. Either that, or only we can see our own reflections. Whatever the case, there's clearly something living inside our reflections. It may be our true nature, or just some evil being that takes on a specific form or identity. Its motivation, unknown. Its mission, to get me to come to it. Our reflections react to us, but we react to these reflections. Just keep it in mind that when you are all alone, and there is some sort of mirror image of yourself in the room, it is watching you. And one day, it may show itself to you. When it does, I hope someone is there to save you. So, how many times have you checked your reflection to see if you'd see what they did and praying to your God that you don't? I'm sure it was just yourself that you saw in the mirror. But as you just heard, just because you don't see it now doesn't mean it's not there. Go ahead, take another peek. While you play hide and seek with your reflection, let me move us to the next story of the night. This one is a letter of apology. This apology is written to you, the humans. This letter comes from a being far greater than humanity that is apologizing on behalf of his kind. Why is he apologizing? Who or what exactly is his kind? Look to the skies and find out as you listen to him. Apology to Homo Sapiens Esteemed humans, I am here to apologize for my kind's reckless behavior and yours. You tend to define the harassment of the scum of our society as supernatural and scary, when in fact we are completely rational, albeit non-material, beings. Let me explain with a brief summary of human and post-human evolution. Until about 70,000 years ago, a billion years ago in my time of origin, Homo sapiens were nothing but insignificant apes roaming the East African savanna. But one day a little error was made, while a sperm was matching its genetic code with an egg. We call that error the cognitive revolution. That error changed only the wiring of the sapiens brain. Namely, it made the brain more flexible. Using its newly gained mental flexibility, Sapiens adapted mentality to any new condition. Before the revolution, humans only passed down the same tools from their ancestors. But the new breed of humans could invent new tools that helped them conquer the planet in a matter of few millennia. Note that the new breed of humans, basically anybody who is capable of reading this, have extremely different dreams, ambitions, and sorrows than their ancestors. Those thoughts were so deep that a human born before the cognitive revolution had no hope in understanding them. In short, if you were to try to explain the Bible or the theory of relativity to someone born before the revolution, they wouldn't even understand the basic concept of a god or of time. Next came the agricultural revolution. Humans, who had previously hunted and gathered all across the globe and fit somewhere in the middle of the food chain, learned the absolute basics of biotechnology. They could feed themselves by growing crops. This way, they could live sedentary lives. They had more time to sit and think. 
it didn't take the tribes to subjugate hunter-gatherers by sheer numbers. In turn, this allowed religion and empires to flourish. These primitive structures would take some of the crop yield. In exchange, they would provide security, physical and psychological. A problem with kings and priests were that they blindly assumed that they knew everything there is to know about the world. But a series of unfortunate, unexpected events, the Black Death, the discovery of America, caused several folks from Europe to leave that assumption aside, which led to the admittance of ignorance and the will to learn the truth. This is known as the Scientific Revolution. In the wink of an eye, approximately 550 years between the 1500s and 2050s, this revolution led to a chain of technological events it ended with, the singularity. To explain the singularity, we must first explain the final few generations of Homo sapiens. In fact, you're one of them. You've hit your biological limitations. In other words, your technology has become so advanced that your old-fashioned organic bodies cannot keep up. Think about it. The human lifespan is stuck at around 80 years. Computers process information faster than your brain can perceive the result. The next logical step for your generation is to evolve beyond biology altogether. And your successors, our far ancestors, have done just that. That brings mankind to the singularity, also known as the Second Cognitive Revolution. This revolution came about when our ancestors replaced their organic brains with supercomputer arrays. Along with the organic brain, almost every human emotion was forgotten, only to be replaced by deeper and more complex ones. Do not try to understand them. You are in the exact same situation as the sapiens before the first cognitive revolution. You should only know that our cybernetic ancestors have managed to colonize and subjugate the Milky Way and many other galaxies. They were feared overlords of a considerable part of the universe. But even they had to give way to the final stage of evolution, the transcendence. The last generation of cybernetics was able to bend and reshape all the ten dimensions of the universe at their own will. But they themselves were confined to a physical body, just like your organic bodies couldn't keep up with your technology. Their physical bodies couldn't keep up with their abilities. So using technology and science you cannot even begin to understand. They managed to represent themselves as a series of disturbances in the fabric of the ten dimensions. So we became independent, not only of bodies, but also of time and space. We do not perceive the universe as a continuum. We just see a ten dimensional shape in which we can freely travel. We had essentially become gods. You may think the transcendental evolution also meant absolute moral evolution, but you are unfortunately wrong. Some of the scum of our godly society, who arrogantly think they have the right to kill or torture beings of lower evolutionary state, have been harassing you. Almost every mythical creature that unleashes fear in your heart, as such, are rejects from our society. We promise to do everything we can to catch and execute those bandits, and we apologize as a species on behalf of their reckless behavior. Signed, Aleph. The Singularity, one of my favorite theories out there, that would almost be worth coming back to life for. Almost, but not quite. Who knows, maybe you'll survive long enough to reach that point. Maybe you'll be one of the ones that travel backwards through time. Maybe the creature that haunts you, or scares you the most, is you. While you contemplate that, let me give you this week's recommendation. This week, in honor of the holidays, I am recommending the horror comedy, Krampus. When his dysfunctional family clashes over the holidays, young Max is disillusioned and turns his back on Christmas. Little does he know, this lack of festive spirit has unleashed the wrath of Krampus a demonic force of ancient evil, intent on punishing non-believers. All hell breaks loose as beloved holiday icons take on a monstrous life of their own, laying siege to the fractured family's home and forcing them to fight for each other if they hope to survive. This is just a movie to get you into the holiday spirit or make you wonder if Krampus is coming for you. So go to wherever you get your movies from and pick up Krampus. Now that I've given you this week's recommendation, let's take a trip down to open mic night at Piazel Pub. Well, 
Welcome, fiends, to open mic night at Beazel Pub, where we invite you to sit right here and go into the more poetic side of fear, poems of murder, creatures, and ghosts, all the things that scare you the most. To open the pub tonight is a poem by Tetsuya about someone who is ready to give themselves up to the creatures of Lovecraftian lore. And the final poem of the night, written by Terhalish and Dershatten, about a town on Christmas Eve, and how things there will not be vibrant and filled with Christmas cheer. Enjoy the rhythmic verses, and lose yourself while you enjoy, in faith and fear, and eternal cold. Leather-bound book, feed me all the answers, bleach my brain, and birth me again. Teach me, give me everything that you know, I'll assume what you don't. Use me, my body is your vessel, I will use you. This nonsensical Necronomicon, to nurture and to nullify, as I see fit. Guide me along the winding road of life, I believe, in the plagues descended upon the sinful. Creatures saved from devastation. As I sit with my own life in ruin, I will whisper, I believe, I have sinned many times without number, and I will be forced to do it once again. No matter how great the number, you will tell me what you forgive. Forgive me for my voice. For speaking out of turn, vanquish my vile vitriol. Forgive me for my thoughts. Doubting, drowning, no matter the path. I follow from now on. I will be whispering. I believe. was the night before Christmas and all through the town. Smiles were fading and becoming frowns. Frowns frozen solid, forever displayed. The eternal cold has now left us dismayed. Dismayed and dishonored and dead on the floor. I knew that we shouldn't have answered the door. The door to the outside were laying in wait. The eternal cold began sealing our fate. Our fate that had once entranced our very core. Oh, why did we have to go answer the door? For behind the door, with meticulous thought, the eternal cold changed our life count to naught. Our life, which had seemed just so normal before, had come through the window, then flown out the door. The door that had once blocked the passage to death, but once it was open, the cold stole our breath. Our breath mystified and spewing from our mouths. The cold brought our souls from the inside to out. Once our souls were stolen, repercussions made clear. The eternal cold would mark our resting place here. Resting place, a misleading name I am sure. It actually means that we're dead on the floor. The floor, which came closer so fast when it came. The eternal cold had brought doom to our names. Names now meant naught but identification. For the bodies on the floor, so fast they were taken. The Great Old One will surely hear their plea and take them. Hopefully, cause Cthulhu. And poor humans, all excited for Christmas and presents, but nope, the eternal cold had other ideas. I wonder if that means there's a town that is just filled with free presents. I'll have to go check after the show. Until then, let's leave the pub behind, get you humans back home, and move to tonight's main feature. This feature I call Season Screaming. This month, I'll be bringing you tales of holiday horror to remind you that the holidays aren't always cheery and bright. So, for the first holiday-themed story, I bring you one that may not mention the creature by name, but it's clear who it was. A story about a father who wakes up from a noise on the roof and goes to check on his son, only to find him already awake and standing near the tree. What happens next is every parent's nightmare. Maybe move away from your chimney for this one and enjoy. My son heard Santa on the roof. My son heard something on the roof last night. Police lights cover our living room as I type this. It was Christmas Eve, and we were all tucked into bed, like we should have been. 
That was when I heard a pounding sound coming from the ceiling. My wife rustled a bit in her sleep, but remained still. I, on the other hand, could not. I got up out of bed and went to check on my son. When I got to his bedroom, he wasn't there, which scared me. I rushed out of his room and looked over the stairs balcony into the living room. There was my son, standing in front of the chimney, next to all the presents my wife and I had wrapped just an hour ago. Great, I thought. It looked like we'd get no sleep before we'd have to open presents. I journeyed down the stairs and made my way past the kitchen and into the living room. What are you doing up so early? My son turned to me and said, I heard Santa Claus on the roof and I wanted to come down and see him. I lifted a brow as I glanced at the presents he was steadily ignoring beside him. Looks like Santa brought you a lot of gifts this year. You must have been a good boy. My son looked at the ground with a frown. Why a long face, bud? Santa says that you wrapped those gifts yourself. You've talked to Santa, have you? He looked back down at the floor. He told me not to tell you. This had me a little worried. I wondered if my wife had taken our son to a mall Santa. And maybe he'd been drunk and spilled the beans about the magic of Christmas to our child. Don't listen to that Santa, buddy. Those presents have Santa's name on them. Now how about we open gifts? I'll wake your mother up. And as soon as I make her a cup of coffee, we'll open these bad boys. Okay? He turned back to the chimney and I went to go brew my wife a cup of coffee. As I brewed the coffee, I could hear my son whispering something to himself. Hey bud, who are you talking to? He turned around and said, Santa. Then he fell to his knees and collapsed into his palms. I looked towards the chimney and saw a long, slim, black and gray striped sweater arm going down the chimney with a long fingered bony hand around my son's ankle. I dropped the mug of coffee to the ground, shattering it into pieces. I took a few steps forward, but it was all fruitless. The chimney absorbed my son, pulling him upward into it. His screams echoed off the bricks, until the only thing I could hear was pounding on the ceiling. No, the rooftop. I ran outside, ignoring my wife's yells from upstairs, and quickly peered up at the roof, where a tall, scrawny, old, bearded man stood. His eyes were sunken in, and the eyes themselves were pitch black. Antlers extended out from his forehead stretching out towards the night sky. He had a bulging sack over his shoulder. It must have been my son, squirming inside the bag for dear life. The bearded man looked over at me, put a finger to his lips, then leaped to my neighbor's rooftop and then to the next until he was out of sight. My wife ran outside to me and asked where our son was. I told her to phone the police, which she did. And that brings us to where we are now. Police have questioned me repeatedly. At first... I gave them the true story of what happened. When they didn't buy it, I changed my story, and they threw it up to me and they threw it up to me being shaken by what had happened. In the end, I told them there had been a robbery and my son had been kidnapped. What I told the police before though was that my boy had heard Santa on the rooftop. But I don't think it was Santa. It seems like Krampus, or something like him, has himself another victim. Christmas will never be the same for those parents, ever again. Hopefully, Krampus leaves some holiday fun for the rest of us spooky motherfuckers. I mean, is it even the holidays without fun, food, and murder? I don't think so. But now, I believe it is enough scares for this week. I hope you will join me again next week. For more stories that are sure to keep you afraid during the day and awake at night. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the stories I had for you tonight. And until next time, 